Hello and welcome into the Cubs on Deck podcast. I am one of your hosts. My name is Greg Huss and today I am joined by the broadcaster of the Tennessee Smokies and host of the Cubs baseball channel on YouTube. I'm joined by Mick Gillespie. Mick, how's it going, man? Hey, what do you say, guys? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been good. Um, ran into the rotavirus and the only reason I say that is because um, it's got to be about as close to death as you can get. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's in 24 hours and then all of a sudden you're like tired, but you survive. Right. But that, that 24 hours of rotavirus is awful. And, um, th- just to give you an idea of how bad it was, uh, that my son goes to Fairhope West elementary, right. It made national news last week because 700 of the people in the school got it in the same day of the 900 to go to school there. Jeez. Yeah. And then he brought that home. And so, uh, yeah, I saw the uh, the Home Depot bucket a lot, and uh, you know, th- and, and couldn't get comfortable for a day. <laughs> and I've heard it's it's everywhere right now. Yeah, so, yeah. So I survived it. I'm back. I need a shirt that says "I survived the rotavirus." You survived it. I appreciate you. You uh, not exactly full strength hopping on the show. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm glad to have you on. We're we're talking Tennessee Smokies today. Um, I guess before we get into this um, a little bit, I want to give you the chance to kind of. Uh, talk about yourself a little bit. You've been with the Smokies for uh, quite some time broadcasting over there. Um, what's the what's your credentials, I guess, Mick? Well, I mean, I have been there for a while, and um, now I'm a broadcaster of a championship, which meant a, an awful lot to me, you know, just to be through some tough years where we stunk and then the, the even the tougher years where we lost in the championship series, you know, like four times. So this was the fifth time I went. And we won, but uh, you know, I've been the broadcaster for the Smokies since 2007. I grew up a Cubs fan. I watched Harry and Steve on television, and that's why I wanted to do this. I wanted to be kind of like Harry Carey, uh, even though I'm in a business where having a personality these days is frowned upon by some. But the only way you're ever going to be great is by stepping out of the vanilla and, you know, and putting your feet into the chocolate, right? I mean, you gotta be, you gotta be able to, to be entertaining. And so I try to do that every day. Our broadcast, I'm really proud of it. Uh, we're one of the most watched minor league broadcasts, uh, in, and minor league baseball, uh, won the broadcaster of the year award, you know, was a finalist for it, you know, more times than that. And, and I don't even know if those things really matter. I mean, I think that it comes down to being on the air and just having people like what you do, you know. So I've been lucky to work with some great people and have some great games to call. So I do that. I cover Alabama. I went to school at Bama. And you know, I used to work for the Crimson Tide Sports Network and do a lot on YouTube now, um, which is a lot of fun podcasting and owning your own content, as you know, being able to dictate the direction that things are moving. Uh, I like that, that a lot, but the Cubs baseball channel, I'm sure people on here are going to want to check that out. And I really appreciate them. Yeah, for sure. And then you mentioned the, the, the broadcasting as a part of a Cubs affiliate. I mean, I think that this whole month we're doing season previews of the four affiliates. And I think that we are, I reiterate it so often on this channel, on this, on this podcast that we are so lucky to have just a great group of broadcasters uh, among the four affiliates, and so it's going to be a fun month here ahead as we preview each of the four, uh, each of the four affiliates. We've got you on Mick this week. We've got uh, Brendan King and, and Max Toma coming up for South Bend at some t- some point here soon. We got Alex Cohen for Iowa. We've got Sam Weeder half for Myrtle Beach. All of you guys will be on the show this month. It'll be fun. Uh, but today we are locked in on the Tennessee Smokies, who I mean, last year coming off of like you mentioned, a, a championship winning team. Um, uh, a fun team throughout the entire year, put up a great record from basically from day one until the last day of the, of the postseason. I mean, it's going to be hard to beat what we saw from the Smokies last year, right? In terms of, of the quality of play, the, the personalities that we saw on the field and off the field in Tennessee. And just like, it was watching Tennessee Smokies baseball last year was just appointment television every single night. Yeah, I mean, look, starts with Hollywood Pete, right? Pete Crow Armstrong and you know, th- what he would do in the field and what he would do on the bases and what he would do at the plate. You know, so much fun watching that. And Owen Casey was so good. And people are starting to see that now at the major league level. Um, and, you know, Cade Horton in the postseason and B.J. Murray 
who I don't think gets enough credit. I mean, no one ever talks about B.J. Murray. He was in the Futures game, and he was the MVP of the championship. I mean, he he's such a good player. But there were a lot of really good players around the diamond last year. It was such an interesting season, you know, with with Kevin Graber coming in and and having to manage the team, and you know, everyone um, really liked Michael Ryan, and you know, and and then he left, and you know, and Graber came in and couldn't have done a better job. And it's just such a, I guess every championship has its story, you know, and we we had that. I mean, it was really was magical. The tough part from my vantage point is that the Cubs have so many regulations on the way that these guys can play the game that you don't always get to see exactly what they're going to do in a truly competitive environment until you get there. And we saw yeah. that with the team the last two years in the postseason. We went, once they cut the cord, these guys just accelerated. They lost the championship series two years ago, right? In the championship game, they had two games – to clinch it and didn't do it. And then last year they just went in and crushed everyone, which to be honest with you, I thought was perfect because I didn't need the drama in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will, we'll probably start this entire thing off the of Kate Horton because that's only appropriate, but I, I want to preface this and I'll preface every single episode we're doing. As far as a season preview, we're going to run through some players here. We're going to run through quite a few names. Uh, we're going to break down starting pitchers, relief pitchers, and then the position players as well. Um, I've kind of, gone through and I, I posted over on my Twitter account at out of the vines, uh, what I've kind of got as a, as an organizational depth chart, as of right now, as of today, we're, we're sitting here early March. Uh, we don't know where these players will for sure be assigned. We'll know that later on in the month, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but for this purpose, for these preview purposes, I've kind of assigned these, these players to certain affiliates. So these guys we're talking about today, we're going to start with Cade Horton. He might be assigned to Iowa out the gate that might happen, but he needs somewhere. We, we got to talk about him somewhere. And so it might as well be here. I think it's only appropriate that we start off with the starting pitchers. We start off with Cade Horton, who is outside of Pete's, the most exciting prospect to follow in this organization. Uh, so we're starting off these season previews with Cade Horton, man. I, what he did in the playoffs was outrageous. What he did last year in general was outrageous. Like, what can we expect to see from Cade Horton this year coming off of a season last year where he just burst onto the radar like no one could have ever expected? And I, I complain a lot about allowing pitchers to pitch and pitch counts and all of that stuff. But uh, that doesn't apply to everyone. I, I would definitely have him in bubble wrap. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, and I get that like as an organization, he's, you know, he had the injury in college and he's come back from it. This is the most, this is the most talented pitcher the Cubs have had since prior and wood. And think about that. And I've, I've been around a long time. I've seen these guys and there's been some good ones. Andrew Kashner was a good one. Um, uh, you know, Kyle Hendricks in a different way was a really good pitcher. Um, Chris Archer was really exciting. You know, there was a guy named Trey McNutt who had, you know, where you would see some stuff from him and it didn't really pan out. But this guy has it, man. I mean, it's the fastball. It's the 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 slider, which is just killer. You know, he's he's mean enough where he pitches inside, and uh, guys have a difficult time, you know, picking up the elevation. And I guess it's because of the spin rate. You know, I'm not an analytics guy. I just watch the reaction that the hitters have. So if I'm the Cubs, I I, I just don't want to do anything to get him hurt. He's he's got to be a little bit better. To me, I think it just comes down to, you know, first pitch. Just get the first pitch over a little more consistently. But this guy has superstar written all over him, first, first, second guy in the rotation. And we just haven't had a lot of those pitchers come through the organization since I've been there, you know. And, I mean, I'm rolling on 20 years, you know. So this is something that they've wanted for a long time. Oh, they haven't made a trade and traded him to the White Sox because the other guy like that was Dylan Cease. And so – um He's someone to be really excited about. Yeah, I think that that regardless of if Cade is assigned to Tennessee or if he's assigned to Iowa or if he's he's held back and extended to to kind of manage that workload this year, regardless of, of where he's at, I think that there's not many starts in the minor leagues ahead for him this year before we see him called up to Chicago, right? I, I, don't, I don't know how many, but I, we've seen the trend. I've mentioned it on the show in the past, but we've seen a trend in recent years where with these – upper echelon type prospects, these guys that are top 50 in all of baseball, those top pitching prospects 
organizations aren't wanting to waste those bullets on the minor leagues, right? Mm -hmm. It's different with, with other pitching prospects, other pitching prospects, get that seasoning in, make sure they're good and ready for the major league level. Um, but I've, I've referenced back to a guy like, like Yuri Perez, who was in the Marlins organization a few different times where it's like, Hey man, if, if, if that stuff is there, if that stuff can get major league hitters out, which I think Cade's stuff can, let's not waste those bullets and, and no, no offense to you and double a, right. Yeah. I know you want to see him, see him thrive there, but it's like I'm wasting my bullets there. I'm ready. <laughs> I think that's yeah, right. And, I and think it's good to see him in the major too. leagues, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, he's right-handed too. And they're, they're very left-handed heavy in the starting rotation. He's just got to be ready to go do that. The only concern I have with him and you saw it with Wicks last year is when you limit these guys so much in yeah. the minor yeah. leagues, you, you're saving, their bullets but then they get to the big leagues and, and it's really hard for them not just physically but mentally to be prepared to face the lineup you know inning six seven and a lot of these guys hardly pitch four innings and in starts yeah. but, but i'm a big believer in kate horton i just there's just something about him and i hope that i'm right because you know when you put him in the category of prior and wood i mean it's it's pretty high praise but that's the way i see it yeah, let's let's pivot from Cade, who's a guy obviously top pros top one of the top prospects in the organization, to the rest of the rotation. That there's really some good arms in the rotation besides Cade. Not those top ten prospects in the organization, but good arms nonetheless. Um, let's talk about Cole Franklin and Brandon Birdsell particularly, because I think they're they're following two different paths up to this point. We've seen Cade, or uh, sorry, Cole Franklin has been in the organization for quite a while at mm -hmm. this point. Um, he's flashed some really good stuff and I think he's continuing to improve, but he's been around a while versus Brandon Birdsell. Last year was his first year in first full season in the organization. And he, if, if we weren't talking so much about Cade, we'd probably be talking a lot more about what Brandon Birdsell did last year, making it up to double A. Yeah. I think Franklin just got to get more consistent. The, the good Cole Franklin is really good. Yeah. And then there's just certain days where it, it's really bad. And I think you just want a little bit more consistency there. But he's definitely someone that you like having in your pitching rotation. Just like I said, you know, it's it's all about the consistency. And are you going to be able to make that jump to get to the next level? And then Bird sells interesting. I like him a lot. And, and it's because he throws strikes. I mean, it sounds so simple, but it's so difficult for so many guys to go out and just throw strikes. And challenge hitters he gives up a ton of home runs but they're not as bad as you would think because there's never you know it's it's like he's challenging you to put the ball in play and mm -hmm. i think that wrigley april and may is a place where if you hit fly balls you're out and i think in the big leagues as he gets better and better uh that that he'll he'll eventually turn a lot of those into outs instead of mm -hmm. home runs i think he'll get better but he commands the ball and he throws strikes got into the postseason last year and there he was throwing more strikes. You know, he had his the best game in the postseason, but I, I like him. I just, when I think back at the guys who have made it from, you know, the low minor leagues through double A AA to triple A to the big leagues pitched and had success. It's the guys that throw strikes. I, I think that he'll have a really big jump this year. Because first it starts with throwing strikes and then you get confidence in your secondary stuff and you can work off of that. So I, he's someone that I would definitely put a circle around and say, hey, this is someone that you, you need to keep an eye on. Yeah, I was going to say, I've got I've got Birdsell highlighted on my like guys to watch this year. It's going to be so important to see as he's now kind of consistently in the upper minors. He's in double A's and triple A does that walk rate start to creep up? Because if it is, that's going to be a little dangerous, especially with the hom homers he's given up. If he can keep that walk rate down, um, I think if we see some even more improved stuff, the the a little bit more break on the on the breaking balls, a little bit more velo, he could really take off the other way, right? So I think this is an important year for who exactly is Brandon Birdsell. Can he maintain that, like, what, 2 3 4% walk rate, which is, like you said, like it's a super low walk rate and something you'd love to see especially from these, from these prospects. Um, well, with no yeah. experience as a professional either. I mean, you're talking about exactly. guys that are pretty much straight out of college and the things that you can get away with in college, you can't get away with as a pro and they make adjustments to that, you know? So that's another part of it, but yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah. I, I do want to cover a few more guys here that, that might be destined for the, for the rotation in Tennessee. I know that the, these, these are some guys that you haven't seen as much because they, there's a lot of returners um, mm -hmm. to this Tennessee roster from from what you saw last year. 
Uh, but Luis Devers, Connor Noland, and Richard Gallardo are, are a few guys that might be destined for that rotation. And coming off the conversation with Brandon Birdsell, you got Connor Nolan and Richard Gallardo that are kind of cut from the same cloth of mm-hmm. Birdsell, where they throw a lot of strikes. Um, Nolan was also a, a draft pick in the same year that Birdsell was, uh, followed a very similar path to what Birdsell did last year, not walking a whole lot of guys, um, keep it, trying to keep trying his best to keep the ball in the ballpark. Um, Richard Gallardo is another case where not walking a ton of guys. We want to see a little uptick in terms of the quality of stuff that he has. Um, but it seems like like Gallardo has been in the organization a lot longer than he really has. I mean, he has been in the organization a while. Mm-hmm. He's still a young dude, though. He's for being uh, uh, likely assigned to double A out the gate this year. He's still a super young guy. So um, all three between Devers, Noland and Gallardo and then throw Birdstall into the mix. A lot of pitch to contact guys. So it's going to be a, a lot of a lot of work for the infield um, in Tennessee and a lot of work for the for the uh, uh, pitching development there to kind of work with these guys and improve their stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Probably a good idea, too. I mean, we got out of wanting guys to get pitched to contact outs and look for soft contact and, you know, and, and, and get through innings on less pitches, and then everybody's up there just huffing, trying to throw it by, a, you know, batters. And it's not as fun of a game to watch, and, and it's harder to win like that. You know, yeah, because you, you're going to get less out of the guys that you have pitching. You know, if you can get guys that get into the games and aren't afraid to, you know, get a guy on two pitches to ground out or fly out and, and not walk a bunch of batters, you're going to be better off, not just in double A, but in the big leagues. And look at the Cubs middle infield. I mean, it's the best in baseball. You might as well have somebody that's going to, you know, get, get them to put the ball in play and uh, and let them do their thing. I mean, when you got defense in this entire organization between Nico and Dansby up the middle in Chicago, you got uh, Pete Crow Armstrong, man in center field. You got Luis Vasquez, who's, mm-hmm. I mean, incredible defensively. You saw him last, you had yeah. a front row seat to him last year. Like, there's a lot of guys that can go out there and pick it. So, um, yeah, I think between those four, I'm, I'm really concentrated on like not necessarily seeing more strikeouts from them, but just continuing to see like, worst quality of contact from the batter's perspective. Like I want them to, to generate some weak contact from those hitters as they're up in double A now. So that's going to be really important. I think that the starting pitching staff is going to be really fun to watch. It's one of my favorites in the entire organization. I mean, I think the entire roster here in Tennessee is going to be uh, one to watch the entire year, but uh, those, those six names particularly are exciting. So uh, you go from a lot of pitch to contact guys in the rotation. So let's transition to the relievers where, there are some dudes that just throw gas that are nasty and generating a ton of swing and miss in that bullpen that are likely, likely going to be assigned there. Um, you got, let me run through four of these names here that we're going to talk about. Uh, and then we can kind of hit on, hit on them individually, but between Zach Lee, Porter mm-hmm. Hodge, who might be in the bullpen, might be in the rotation. We'll see uh, Frankie Scalzo jr. And Eduardo Nunez. Like those are guys that can, can get a lot of swings and misses those four. Who, yeah. Who's your favorite of the of that bunch? I think you've seen all four, right? Yeah, I don't know. I guess I like Scalzo Jr. just because I'm a mustache guy. And anybody that can come out there like Tom Selleck, <laughs> and then and and he's tough. I mean, he I I always felt really comfortable with him on the mound. Mm-hmm. You know, he he's he's going to go give you uh, you know really good innings and got a lot of movement on his pitches and goes right after hitters. But you're right, it's four guys who. Uh, have all had success. You know, I like Zach Lee. He's a really good guy in person, you know, another Texan pitching Porter Hodge. If I was the Cubs, I'd have him as a starter. I I don't understand why they took him out of the rotation, but there could be a reason why that I just don't know. But I I felt like he had the kind of stuff and success that would have been fine to leave him in there. But he was also he looks really like a starter, good in long right? relief. Yeah, but he was good in long relief too. So, yeah, um, I like him. I mean, that's a that's a good group. Nunez, you know, he he throws bullets. So, mm-hmm. well, it, it's what you want in when it comes to your relievers. You do want guys that are going to come in there and just rip, you know. And and all of those guys will definitely do that. Yeah, I think that that this is clearly to me of the four affiliates. Like, this is the bullpen to watch. I know that like. For fans out there that that tune into multiple of these of these uh, uh, affiliate games every night, where they're kind of bouncing around from from mm-hmm. affiliate to affiliate, watching different prospects, I know a lot of people out there do that. I I'm I'm one of those people. I think that it's it's easier once you get towards the later innings if you're watching for the prospects and not necessarily for the teams. 
Uh, it's easier once you get towards the later innings to just kind of be, pay attention to whoever the has, has the, the most stacked lineup that day, right? You're yeah, like man. not really paying attention to the bullpen, guys. I'm telling you, like this bullpen, you do like you are tuning in to the end of Smokey's ball games to watch this bullpen because I think that that Zach Lee, I'm I'm really hoping we get a healthy a healthy season from Zach Lee because he's kind of battled injuries since he was he was drafted a few years back. But like whenever he's in there, between the fastball sitting in the in the mid 90s, but having that that real late life on it, yeah, um, and then the slider is real good from Zach Lee too. Uh, and he's he's coming at a little a weird arm slot does Zach Lee. like it, it's it's not over the top it's not sidearm it's just from a, a a low slot I guess like he strides off really far off the mound uh, Zach Lee's just a fun guy to watch pitch right um, I agree with Porter Hodge you're you're kind of assessment on Porter Hodge I, I I still want to see what he can do in the rotation I'm not maybe we do maybe we do see that this year because like when he gets off the bus you're like oh that's that's a starting pitcher like that's a that's a that's a big time starting pitcher is Porter Hodge. So uh, I'm kind of curious to see what they do now that he's on the 40 man roster. It could be interesting too. Um, if he talented, man. he's yeah, talented, super guy. talented. He really yeah. is. But we don't, they're, they're really secretive about like nicks and bruises and injuries and all that stuff. Yeah. So I, that's why I don't, I don't know why maybe they just felt like they wanted to slow down how many innings he threw, you know, maybe they felt like he would be, uh, you know, better served as a reliever. But when you see him doing his thing and he's at his best, his best is really good. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys out there listening know, I don't need to comment on Frankie Scalzo Jr. anymore. He he was a guest on the podcast here. You guys know how I feel about Frankie. He's, he is one of my favorite in the entire organization as far as people and players. So stash, man, anybody that the stash is a fan. I'm a fan of. I mean, he, he, the personality is like, he's a reliever, right? Like he yeah, is yeah. a like closing pitcher. Like that's his, that's his vibe that he gives off. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, he, he, as soon as he came up, just watching him pitch the first couple of times, you, you just knew like, Hey, this guy, he's for real, man. I Nothing mean, phases him. After, no, he's going to go after you. Um, you know, just a bulldog on the mound. Let's uh let's go ahead and transition into some some position players here because the infield in particular is absolutely loaded. <laughs> it's it's loaded. We'll start off with the catchers because uh we'll throw them into the infield group, obviously. Uh we're gonna say that Pablo Aliendo might be assigned here to double A Tennessee. I think it's it might just be because I wanted to, I wanted to talk about him earlier uh than later. So we'll talk Pablo Aliendo and Moises Ballesteros behind the plate. If if you do have that one-two punch, which Pablo might be in AAA Iowa. We might see that. But like if that one two punch is Moises and Pablo, that it doesn't get much more exciting than that one two punch behind the plate, don't you think? Yeah. Well, I, I just can't see a scenario where Aliendo is with the Smokies. I mean, yeah. I, I just kind of feel like just the way that this thing works, that he would be in in triple A. But mm-hmm. you got Bryce Windham and then all these guys that they signed to uh minor league deals mm-hmm. and and one of the biggest the one of the weakest areas in the um in the in the cub system right now is catcher right mm-hmm. aliendo's to me got to be their top rated guy uh you know moises Ballesteros to me it, it just it, he can hit but he's mm-hmm. not really ready to be a catcher in the big leagues uh i think aliendo's a lot closer um and so you got then you got like that that group of guys, and I'm guessing that a lot of them will be released like right when camp starts. But maybe they hold on to them, and they have you know two of them and Wyndham in in AAA, and then yeah, then that would leave uh, Pablo back in Double A, which could happen, you know. But if if it is the case, and it's him and Biasteros, and be a really good tandem. Uh, but you know, for Biasteros, he's just going to have to get out there and and defensively play the position you know uh i think that's the biggest thing i mean he he's got to get out there and get behind the plate he kind of reminds me a little bit of kyle schwarber i mean look he's not babe ruth and or anything like that but he's a really good hitter but then behind the plate there's a lot of work to be done but he can do it and and that's a great that's what the minor leagues are for you know getting him back there because if he could really become a good defensive catcher with his bat i mean he could be a star player for the cubs and you know, and the, and the bat plays, I mean, he just has like really soft hands at the plate, uh, you know, he, he, quick wrists, like can put the ball in play, really can place it. Advanced I, approach I too. Yeah. Right. Good approach. I, I haven't seen him enough to know like how, 
how much power he could potentially have. But the but I think that the bat definitely could be a next level major mm-hmm. league baseball bat. You know, Pablo's yeah. got some issues. Um, but at the same time, I mean, he he there's time there's you watch him play and you go, okay, if you got the the good Pablo day in and day out, or he just continued to like a Victor Caratini, just just yeah. work and get in, in, and improve, then you know, you could turn him into an everyday catcher in the big leagues. Right now, I would say he probably to me would be like a third catcher or backup you know but at the big league level Jan Gomes is old I mean it just is and if something happens to him then then what you know and I think that's where the Cubs need to go out they should have star catching prospects like they have star shortstops yeah. star out, star outfielders you know you got all this depth everywhere else but catcher so with that said that makes both of these guys really valuable it does yeah I mean you, between having an older Jan Gomes and a Miguel Amaya that I'm I'm really high on, but has dealt with injuries in the past. Like that, that's that's tough to to have a full season out of both those guys. You can't expect to have a full season out of both those guys at the major league level. You want to talk a little bit about? I mean, I've I've seen plenty of it on the broadcast, um, and I know I've heard from players that feel this way. But you want to talk a little bit about Pablo and the relationship that he has with some of his teammates uh, because it just seems like he just oh, is loved. everybody loves him, man. Is yeah, what it feels yeah. like. Well, you cheer for him too, you know. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I saw uh, Hollywood Pete come with the blue hair, <laughs> and I thought he's just copying uh, Pablo, who came to the playoffs with red hair. Yeah, and, and people just like you know get that. No, they don't get that. They just, <laughs> you know, I thought it was funny listening to Carter kind of um, talk about him a little bit for the uh, you know on the marquee broadcast interview. Yeah talking about his hair <laughs> but yeah I, I get it man these guys it's a different generation of player and and i'm an old school guy man i'm a baseball purist but at the same time i love to be entertained man if yeah. you want to wear yeah. red hair i love it if you want yeah. to bat flip as long as it's not like in someone's face and you're just yep. enjoying the game you know i saw where our old buddy dan vogelback took uh <laughs> cold took cold cold deep yeah. And, and he fat flipped, and I'm like, just shut up, man. In a spring he training, a yeah. run in spring training, give, give the guy. Like, he so what? It wasn't in your face. Look, yeah. Baseball, if you're if it's gonna be a successful game moving forward, it's got to become more colorful. Yeah. So uh, Pablo's definitely a, a colorful character with the hair. Um, when when the playoffs came last year, and it was time to get the job done. You know, he locked in and did that. And you learn a lot about players from the postseason because the, the regular season in the minor leagues with the Cubs is like it, it really is like spring ball or record, yeah. you know, like it, it, you, you the, the team wants to win. The manager wants to win. And then all of a sudden you have like a governor on you, which is like, you know, they what they put on engines to s- keep the tractor trailers from going over 70 miles an hour. They're not going to be able to go past that because the engine's fixed. That's how the Cubs do it, you know, with the pitch counts and, you know, in the lineups and all this other stuff. And this guy's taking too many pitches or he, he his exit velocity's down. We're going to give him three days off. You know, um, baseball used to be played by playing it. You know, like, hey, mm-hmm. go out in minor leagues, you play as many games. And when you're tired, we're going to put you in for another two weeks because we want you to go through that so that when you get to the big leagues and then you need to play down the stretch, you don't look like the Cubs did last year with two weeks to go. Right. Yeah. So, yep. Um, Or you better be good at load management where you you have taken all of that out and you have those guys ready at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, Pablo, Pablo has a good future. You yeah, know. he he turned it on in the playoffs. You know he has that extra gear, and that's good, that's good important. bat, not great. Good bat, you know, hits hits doubles, you know, strikes out a lot, but gets hot. Yeah, um, you know, he can throw the ball some, you know, can block it, and uh, I I I just I would probably slot him right now. Like I said, like a third string catcher with mm-hmm. the potential to be a to, to be a really good catcher. This is an important year for him because he definitely made strides last season, but mm-hmm. it's up to the Cubs and really the Rovers, you know, like. That when they come to town and they work with guys like like him, I remember um, Tim Cousins was a great roving catching instructor. You know, my buddy Jody Davis, you know, watching him work with Wellington Castillo, Steve Clevenger, you know, guys that, that, that they helped get to the major leagues. Robinson Torinos, who was just an amazing catcher mm-hmm. uh, and had some 
concussion I issues. But pa Aliendo, Pablo Aliendo has all that talent. It's just a matter of putting the time in and maybe getting lucky with the injuries and making this the year where he turns the corner. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Let's go from him to a guy that I know you mentioned earlier. I know you want to talk about B.J. Murray because the corner the corner infield um, at Tennessee is a couple of guys and B.J. Murray and Hayden McGeary, who I, I'd argue are both B.J. for sure. Uh, but I'd argue that both are just about ready for Iowa. Like I, I, I had B.J. penciled in to be the opening day starting third baseman in Iowa to start off this year. But again, the depth that the Cubs have at the upper levels in AAA is really starting to like, all right, now I'm kind of looking at BJ and Hayden both being in in uh, in AA to start off the year, uh, knowing that he's too advanced. These two, these guys are too advanced for that level. What are your thoughts on, on the corner infield between BJ and Hayden? So I think Hayden McGarry has a lot more work to do defensively than BJ Murray, right? Yep. Um, and so I'll start with BJ, but I like both guys. BJ Murray... I, I really questioned the lack of power, right? I said, well, if you're going to play third base, you got to, you got to hit home runs. And uh, Owen Casey and I had a conversation about him and he goes, man, you know, um, so watch him at the plate, like watch his eye. And you start to see that like Joey Votto, young Joey Votto type eye at the plate. I know he's not a lefty, he's a righty, but, or he's actually switch hitter. Switch, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But just, Billy Williams told me one time, if you can imagine this, young Billy Williams, spring training with the Cubs, Rogers Hornsby sitting behind him, and he's you know yelling at him, know your strike zone. Know your strike zone. Know your strike zone. And, and then Billy's like, and I should have got a dozen balls signed by Rogers. <laughs> be worth day, right? um, but to be successful, a successful hitter, you really do need to know your strike zone. And I think that that is Murray's superpower is that he's got an incredible eye. It's impeccable. And so as he gets closer to the major leagues, the strike zone is going to get better. Yeah. And I think that that is going to make him a better player, right? Because, because then all of a sudden the, the pitches that are called strikes that really are balls are going to be balls, you know, and, and maybe even the robo umps, you know, because mm -hmm. if he knows where the strike zone really is every time. Yeah. That's true. So I think that's going to help him. And then the way I saw him accelerate his game in the postseason and and take it to the next level gives me a lot of confidence that he's eventually going to do that. Um, I haven't seen him in a whole lot of spring training games so far this year. And I wonder if it's because the Cubs are saying, hey, you got to improve defensively at third. I think he can do that. Uh, and, and it's really consistency. You yeah. know, it's not like he's bad at third. The bad games come in bunches, but that happened to Brooks Robinson, and he's the maybe the best defender at third base of all yeah. time. You know, I mean, look, the guy had like three errors in games before and stuff. I'm not saying BJ Murray's Brooks <laughs> Robinson. I'm not saying it happens, right? Yeah, he's got. I think he's got to get a little more consistent defensively at third, but I still think he's a good third baseman. And then I think that the power's got to come. You know, I, yeah. I if I'm the Cubs. I'm saying, hey, I need you to hit some more home runs. But what I'm thinking is at the same time, you don't want to take his ability to, to know when a pitch is a ball or a strike away from him because getting on base is as important sometimes as anything else that you're trying to do. And a lot of the analytics people, they love that. And so I'm sure they love him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, the power is the main thing for me, for B.J. Murray. I mean, because I, I, I know he can, he can put together at bat. I know he's improving at third base. Um, I know the bat to ball skills are good too for BJ. Um, he's not striking out a ton. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's so important to me that he hits for more power. And I, he showed flashes of that last year. He showed flashes where he could, he could really tap into some pull side power, which is going to be just terribly important for him this year. So that, I'm, I'm going to keep my eye on, on that for sure. With Hayden, I'm going to keep my eye on his ability to kind of keep the ball in the air. We know, we know Hayden McGarry can hit the ball 2 million miles an hour. That's, that's, that's a given. Now I want to see him do it more consistently in the air because it, it, it means more when you're hitting it hitting it 115 in the air than it does 115 right at the shortstop. So that's going to be important. Uh, up the middle, uh, you got Matt Shaw, who might be at third base, might be at second base. You got James Triantos, might be at second base, might be at third base, might be in the outfield. Uh, those two guys are, are cut from the same cloth for sure. We've talked about that on this podcast quite a bit. 
what do you got your eye on as far as Matt Shaw and James Triantos, assuming they're both assigned to, to, to Tennessee this year? I think Matt Shaw is a really exciting prospect. Cub scouting has done an excellent job, but it's not just amateur scouting, though. It, well, amateur scouting, but even the the trades that they made to get yeah. prospects, they've done a, a, a really good job of getting the type of players that you can build an organization around. Because Theo really left the cupboard bare. And I know that Theo and Jed are like, uh, you know, like Fred and, and, and Barney. And I mean, yeah. like, you know, they're boys, but I feel like the that – Jed's definitely under the microscope a little bit because, you know, he's the one that's got to live up to, you know, this Cubs expectation when he really didn't have much of a system to work with. When yeah. You know, you know, decided to to take, you know, the next step in his career and leave, you know, um, and he and he's done a nice job of that. I mean, who wanted to be the guy to break up the only World Series team that the team that the organization's had in over 100 years? Right. Yeah. And he's done that. And so. They brought in a bunch of these good players. Then they go out and draft good players. Matt Shaw being one of those. I, I like Matt Shaw. He's a baseball player's baseball player. You know, just knows the game, knows where to throw the ball. It's like he's he's just programmed right. And what what it reminds me of is that kids grow up playing in all of these tournaments, right? They they all they do is play baseball. Mm -hmm. And and it's not like when we were kids, you'd play out back in the sandlot and then yep. you know, once in a while you'd go play at the rec field or and, you know these like 15 game seasons. I mean these guys do nothing but play baseball. Chris Bryant yeah. remember Chris Bryant and, and Mike Bryant telling me about all the games that they had and everything. I feel like Matt Shaw is one of those guys. He's just a great athlete but he's really smart. He's probably played a million games through you know growing up. He went to Maryland and uh you know which has become kind of a baseball school. Cubs draft him and there he is and I see him in double A. It's his first year as a pro and he just knows what to do. He doesn't throw the ball to the wrong position. He fields it the right way. His foot, his footwork is good. I, you know, I, I don't know what his arms like to play third base. That's the one thing that I really want to keep an eye on. I, I've watched a little bit of it in spring training, and it seems like it's a little bit of a huff for him. But I think that that's also something you develop too. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, uh, to me, it's I think that it's more important to to play third base with good footwork and positioning. Then you know to have to rely on having a, you know an incredible arm. I think his arm's good enough, but mm -hmm. he has he's going to be in the big leagues pretty soon. Uh, maybe this year, maybe next year, but he'll be there. Hayden McGarry, I think, has a longer path because, like Craig Council talked about, and I see it the same way. Baseball is not just about the bat. You know, it's a yeah. it's a, it's a game that the whole player matters. Hayden is big and strong. He's got this amazing exit velo on the balls that he hits because he's so strong. Uh, I saw him absolutely terrorize the Rocket City Trash Pandas last year. Like I felt bad for him because <laughs> he just he just beat them into the ground. And then other teams, you know, he would struggle. You know, mm -hmm. that, that that pitched him differently. But with all of that said, the bat's going to be fine. It's defensively, he's too big to catch. He's a catcher. And and it when you see him catching, it looks like uh like Billy Madison catching, you know, <laughs> like he's it looks like a little leaguer with an adult behind the plate, you know. Yeah. So now he's trying to play first base, and there's been some growing pains there, but he got better as the season went on. Still, he's got a ton of improvement to do, and the only way that he's going to do that is he's got to play a bunch of first base yeah, reps, reps, reps. And, yeah. Yeah. And then get out there and work. But you know what? I mean, I, I would sit here and criticize and I could tell you like some of the things that I saw at the beginning of this time at first base and, you know, and, and we could really doubt hit, that it could happen, that he would be mm -hmm. able to figure it out. But as rough as it was at the beginning, I saw him put in the time, you know, I saw him out yeah. there taking the ground balls and, and, you know, practicing, you know, picking balls at first base and doing the things that you got to do. And, and he's, he's a big dude. He's a baseball player. Uh, and so he's just got to continue that. I mean, he's got to wake up every day. If I'm him, I'm waking up every day and I'm thinking, you know what, I just want to get to first base and at least do 15, 20, 30 minutes of just drills, yeah. you know, because, and the reason why is because there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. If you're, you know, I mean, like, yep. 
even the minimum salary in the big leagues is a pot of gold. Imagine literally, yeah, you can hit like him, you know. Yeah. You, you, but right now, his defense has got to come. So, it's still got so far to go. You make those kind of mistakes in the big leagues, and they'll boo you right out of town, you know. So that's why. But it, but he can do it. So I, I think that that's yeah. it, and just the the defense, the rest of the game. Uh, he's a, he's a classic cleanup hitter. Yeah, the, and the the last infielder that I, I want to hit on very briefly is Triantos, who I, I think that James Triantos is going to be an interesting follow this year. Interesting to guy to keep an eye on. I, I think that the expectation by a lot of fans was that he was going to be the the player dealt away for some sort of major league talent this offseason. He was going to kind of headline some sort of trade package. Obviously, he was not. He's still here uh, on March 3rd as we sit here and record this. But, uh, yeah, I think that, that watching James Triantos to see how the Cubs uh, decided to deploy him, how the coaching staff obviously in Tennessee decides to deploy him, is going to be important, right? If he's playing second base most of the time. We saw last year he was, he was predominantly a second baseman. Mm -hmm. The previous year he was predominantly a third baseman. So is he playing those two positions? We've seen him play a little bit of outfield, whether it's left or center, um, a little bit of it in South Bend last year, like very little, um, and then some in the Arizona Fall League last year. So where is he playing? Um, is he continuing to develop some of that power? We know we know James Triantos can make contact as well as anybody in the organization. Like he's not going to uh, swing and miss. He's not going to he's not going to strike out. Uh, but we saw a little bit more of that in game power show up last year, and it's going to be important this year to do even more of that in Tennessee, where I think that like once you get up to Tennessee, that's where it kind of starts to show itself a little bit more. Mm -hmm. When you spent time in Myrtle Beach, where it's impossible to hit a home run, you can't hit a home runs in Myrtle Beach. Mm -hmm. And then you go to South Bend when it's so cold the first two months of the season, so hard to hit home runs there. Once you get up to Tennessee, it's going to be important for Triantos to, to develop that power a little bit more um, this year in, in double A. So Keep an eye on him for sure. I, I don't want to keep you too much longer. I'm already going longer than I told you I would here, Mick. But let's let's hit on a couple of the outfielders because I okay. think that we, we have to hit on Kevin Alcantara. He's back. He spent the the tail end of the season last year in Tennessee, um, one of the most exciting players in the organization. He tools off the charts. We're still waiting for him to put all of it together. But, like, how excited are you to see – get a front row seat? You got Hollywood Pete last year. This year you got Kevin Alcantara who is – nearly as exciting in terms of what he does on the field than, than, than Pete Crow Armstrong. Yeah. Two years ago, if Hollywood Pete was the center fielder, the Smokies would have won back-to-back -back championships. Yeah, that's true. You know, they, they took, they took uh, Canario and they didn't give anybody to replace him. And the, so many balls were just missed in the outfield and, you know, and, and, and it really cost that team. They yeah. just weren't able to overcome that. Uh, Alcantara is a, he's just a, well, he's a Jaguar, right? Yes. <laughs> so if I, I, I was, I remember one time I was like, I, they told me that he's, he's got this tattoo and he, da, 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 da. you know, I'm like, you know, <laughs> I was trying to figure out what animal it was. And so it's like, it's Jaguar. I was like, yeah, of course it's Jaguar. It, it's kind of perfect for him, right? Yeah. <laughs> he, he's, he's long and lanky. He's still got to grow into his body. Yeah. And of course he was the guy that the Cubs got back for Chris Bryant along with Caleb Killian, right? And we've been waiting for him to get to uh, to double A. And then they promoted Hollywood Pete, and then he came in. And what I loved about him in the postseason is he's just so hungry. He's almost like Vlad Guerrero Sr., you know, like anything near the plate, he, he's got the reach to get to it, and he'll hit it, you know. Um, he's very aggressive. Sometimes that works against him, but um, he's also – very deadly. I mean, the, the, with the power that he has. So there's going to come a season where all of a sudden he's just going to be, you know, cracking bombs everywhere. And I, that could be this year. Uh, he's, he's an exciting prospect. And I think this is going to be the year. And I think everybody kind of feels like this. It's going to be the year where, um, where he really kind of takes the next jump. Yeah. Um, and I and I said I'm you know what he came from the Yankees I'm thinking uh Canario but yeah he he was traded for Rizzo but it's yeah, the same yeah. thing you know I mean you're talking about these guys that they went and they they made deals for and you kept hearing about them hey you know what this guy's really good or this guy's really good um he got to the postseason last year and 
didn't have a lot of hits, but the ones he had were all like run producers. Yeah. Like Homer, you know, base hit here that drove in a run. You know, he's he's aggressive out on the base pass. The guys like playing for him. So it, it's going to be a really big year for him. It's the to me, it's the year of the breakout for Al- Alcantara, right? Like that. This is we saw last year Owen Casey's breakout in 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 Double A Tennessee, and I'm hoping that this year is the true breakout because we see how talented he is but he hasn't broken out in a big way. And I, I'm hoping this is the year of the breakout for Kevin Alcantara. Uh, last two guys I want to hit on Christian Franklin, who is a little bit further down prospect list than Alcantara. And then Ezekiel Pagan, who is even a little bit further down from that uh, two guys that, that I think are just fun to watch play baseball. You know, like we're, we're hopeful for them as prospects. We hope they make the major leagues at the very least. Like they are just, entertaining baseball players mm-hmm. yeah we saw them both in the postseason last year like yeah. we, just, we 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 were um uh, basically rotating them in left field which is yeah. based on the pitching which was um, which was amazing and they both did a really good job defensively and at the plate you know i, I haven't seen enough to really kind of formulate my thoughts on what they look like mm-hmm. long term but the, the way that they stepped up and kind of just like, it didn't matter which guy was out there. They just did all the things right. You know, it was like, Hey, we're ready for this opportunity and, you know, put us out there. We're going to take care of it. So I'm guessing that we'll see them in the game at the same time a lot more this year. I think so too. Yeah. I think we might see, I mean, if you got an outfield of Kevin Alcantara, Christian Franklin, and Ezekiel Pagan, those are three guys that can go out there and get it in the outfield. Three, yeah. three very fast guys. Christian Franklin's a good defensive center fielder, and you probably see him in left or right this year because Alcantara's got center field covered. So, yeah, yeah I think a who's very play right field. Say that again. I'm gonna miss Owen Casey. I mean, I mean, who's yeah. gonna play right field? Because there's no chance Owen Casey's coming back to Double A. I, I can't imagine Owen Casey, especially no, with the with, with the uh, with the spring training that Owen Casey's putting together right now. That, He's I, looking good. He's he, looking real good. He's not gonna be there. Um, I, I'm guessing that Owen's gonna play first base and they probably need to start working him in the left field just to kind of get used to doing that do you see owen playing a little bit of, of first base down in arizona like on the backfield down there no uh, but i heard about it yeah i think yeah. that's a good idea he he is he really is to me what i would think of as a a, a big time prospect yeah um, I, I just love the bat he's got a great head on his shoulder he's still young he wise long past his age you know what i mean like yep. it's like he's kind of an old soul in there playing baseball and uh i, I love the way that he moves for a big guy kind of reminds me of rizzo yeah you know the yeah. same type of footwork so i i think he could make the transition to first base if that happens or at least doing that but uh, I, I just don't think that he's going to struggle hitting big league pitching i just i don't think that's going to happen i think the biggest thing for him is that middle in breaking pitch that the right-handers throw to him and basically just lay off of that mm-hmm. a little bit better at identifying that pitch or staying out of counts where you have to swing at it. Uh, but, I mean, think about it. Who wants to hit that anyway? Yeah. I think the changeup is going to be a big pitch for him in, in AAA. Mm-hmm. Being able to, to make contact with that with the, with a righty throwing a changeup is mm-hmm. kind of breaking down and away from him. I think that yeah. – He's going to see a lot of that in AAA, I think, with those kind of more veteran pitchers. Mm-hmm. That's going to be yeah. fun. Be yeah, I've seen him do that. You know, I, I think he'll, I think he identifies that one a little bit more. Yeah. Than the than the than the soft stuff down in. But we'll find out. I mean, I I'm curious on that too. I he's going to put up great numbers. Yeah. But yeah, he will. <laughs> what you want to see is what does he do against the top line pitchers? How to yeah. and forget about even the results. Just see how the encounter goes. You know. Mm-hmm. Like, is it a winning encounter or is he striking out and screwing himself into the ground? I, I just think he's going to win those battles and, and then his time will come. And when he gets to the big leagues, I could see him being up there a long time. Yeah, I could too. you know, Owen, Owen Casey kind of cracks me up. Cause you got, you got the, the new school guys that are saying, Oh, like exit velo, exit velo, exit velo. And then you got old school guys that are saying like, just hit the ball hard. Yeah. And then they're both looking at Owen Casey and saying, that's the guy, <laughs> like, yeah, right. you know, it's like, it's, he, he brings everybody together. Everybody together does Owen Casey. So I, I, I love it, but yeah, I'm definitely, and I'm, I'm definitely not into the, uh, uh some of these, you know, these, these analytics, mm-hmm. you know, I, it, it was ridiculous that, some of these people thought that Cody Bellinger, you know, had weak contact hits. 
you know, who gives a crap? I mean, it's a hit, right? It's, and and it's, a, and it's a two strike approach, right? Too. And it, yeah, it's it's called playing good baseball. You know, yeah. there's they're the same people that make excuses up for strikeouts. Well, guess what? When you strike out and you're not putting the ball in play, then you're not really doing anything positive to help your team. Now, I get it. You could ground into a double play or something, but for the most part, you're not going to do that. You're going to do something positive, right? Yeah. Uh, you're going to force them to make a mistake uh, or make a play, right? There's too many strikeouts in the game, and the guys that put the ball in play uh, are are tough outs because of that, you know. And I love the I love those guys that hit the ball. Br- bringing it back to Owen Casey real quick, I think that's why he might fit in with this Cubs major league lineup really well. You got you got the Nico Horns of the world and the Cody Bellingers that are 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 good at putting the ball in play and making contact at this point. Um, even, even the Nick magicals, different story, obviously with Nick magical, but like, like magical. The, the guys that put the ball in play, limit the strikeouts. Hey, if you got some of those guys, you can, you can live with some strikeouts from Owen Casey. Obviously you don't, you want to strike out less, mm-hmm. but it's all about the balance in your lineup in addition to a balanced player too. So that's always interesting to me, but Mick, I, I can't thank you enough for, for coming on the show and previewing these Smokies. I, I want to give you the chance to, what do you got going on? Uh, once again, plug your, your YouTube channel, all that good stuff. Yeah, look, if, if you guys like Cubs baseball and you want to uh, hang out with us, it's uh, the Cubs baseball channel on YouTube. And I try to you know do a, a video every day talking about the Cubs and we'll do some stuff like watch parties and, you know, different things. It, it, it's really just a fun place to, you know, kind of talk baseball and uh, would love to have anybody that's a Cubs fan join us. Yeah, yeah. Mick, again, thanks so much. I appreciate you coming on. Always fun to preview the Smokies. Um, always fun to talk Smokies baseball. You guys have been killing it down there uh, for years on the broadcast, and it's fun to see some good players coming through there uh, the past couple of years and going into this year. So uh, for you listeners out there, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, be sure to uh, follow us wherever you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, all that good stuff. Uh, give us a subscription uh, on the YouTube channel here. Comment below. Give us a like. All that good stuff. We can't thank you enough. Uh, and in the meantime, we'll yeah. see you guys in one short week with, I believe it's going to be the South Bend Cubs preview. So thank you guys, and we'll talk soon. Yo. Yo.